In this lecture, we'll cover metabolic and depositional disorders. So here's a list of the entities we will be covering in this lecture. Broad categories include mucinosis, amyloidosis, cutaneous calcification, ochronosis, gout, erythropoietic protoporphyria, colloid milium, lipoid proteinosis, and nutritional dermatoses. Mucinosis refers to deposition of mucin into the dermis. Let's first remind ourselves what ground substance is. So ground substance is an amorphous gel-like material in which connective tissue fibers are embedded. It's primarily composed of proteoglycans, or PG. PG equals core proteins plus glycosaminoglycans. The functions are to absorb water, to absorb shock from the external environment, and lubrication between collagen and elastic fibers. Glycosaminoglycans can be either proteoglycan bound or proteoglycan free. So proteoglycan bound include chondroitin sulfate, dermatan sulfate, keratin sulfate, and heparin sulfate. And proteoglycan free includes hyaluronic acid, not associated with a core protein. Now, interestingly, hyaluronic acid is the main component of fillers or the material that we use in cosmetic dermatology to help add more volume to skin that has lost its volume, has lost its natural glycamino, uh, glycosamine glycans. So hyaluronic acid is used in cosmetic dermatology every day to help replace that volume. This helps reduce the appearance of wrinkles and makes patients feel better about their appearance. But most pathologic mucinoses are composed of hyaluronic acid, non-sulfated acid glycosaminoglycan mucopolysaccharides. You may remember from step one studying, Hurler syndrome is composed of sulfated glycosaminoglycans. So chondroitin sulfate, dermatan sulfate, keratin sulfate, heparin sulfate, et cetera. So don't forget how important ground substance is, how important glycosaminoglycans are, and how important proteoglycans are in dermatology. Loss of these materials happens in normal aging. However, deposition of these materials can happen in various diseases. So what does mucin look like on hematoxylin and eosin staining? Mucin is secreted by fibroblasts. It's induced actually by cytokines like interleukin-1, TNF-alpha, transforming growth factor beta, and immunoglobulins. On hematoxylin and eosin, it's wispy, stringy, faint blue threads. And the special stains that highlight it include colloidal iron, alcium blue, and toluidine blue, to name a couple, to name a few. I often get the question from residents and medical students asking, how do you tell the difference between solar elastosis and mucin? So solar elastosis typically looks like a blue collagen fiber, whereas mucin is a lot thinner and has these punctate blue stringy appearances. We'll show you some examples of that in the previous slide, in the, in the following slides. Mucinosis is a group of disorders characterized by mucin deposition in the dermis. You can separate this into primary cutaneous mucinosis or secondary cutaneous mucinosis. Primary cutaneous mucinosis include scleroedema, pretibial myxedema, scleromyxedema, and focal mucinosis. Whereas secondary cutaneous mucinosis include things like lupus erythematosus, dermatomyositis, scleroderma, Dagos disease, granulum annulare, and chronic GVHD. In other words, a primary disease process that just so happens to have mucinosis in it. Think about tumid lupus. Tumid lupus, one of the major characteristics is a lot of mucin within the dermis. So here is a table of primary mucinosis. You can think about follicular distribution, focal distribution, or diffuse distribution. So follicular mucinosis, urticaria like mucinosis are going to be the two that are distributed in a follicular architecture. Focal mucinoses include acral persistent papular mucinosis, cutaneous focal mucinosis, myxoid cysts, cutaneous mucinosis of infancy, 
and an entity called neuropathia mucinosa cutanea. Diffuse mucinosis include things like lichen, myxido lichen myxidematosus, scleromyxedema, self-healing juvenile cutaneous mucinosis, scleridema, reticulated erythematous mucinosis, papular and nodular mucinosis of lupus, generalized myxedema, pretibial myxedema, mucinous nevus, and angiomyxoma. I won't read this list, but secondary mucinosis includes many different entities that we cover in different lectures, but that just so happen to have a lot of mucin associated with it. And I will say that you can have these entities and not have a lot of mucin. So for example, sarcoidosis. We don't rely on mucinosis to diagnose sarcoidosis. Warts. We don't rely on mucin at all to diagnose warts. GBHD. We don't rely on mucin to diagnose that either. But you might see increased mucin in these entities, and that may or may not be important in making a final diagnosis, but observing it and understanding that it's not a primary process, it's not a primary mucinosis. Now, mucin isn't a bad thing. As I said, mucin is in normal skin. When we lose mucin, when we lose the substance that gives our skin a little bit of plumpness, what happens is we see wrinkles, we see aging. It's normal to have mucin in normal skin. So mucin is found particularly around appendages, around vasculature. It's found more often in the superficial dermis. So it's not necessarily um, a pathologic entity. If you see it, you see it. And uh, if, you're, if you're suspecting something that is either primary or secondary mucin depositional process, take this into account that you may be looking at normal levels of mucin as well. So at the end of the day, um, mucin is just one part of the picture of the overall pathologic assessment. What happens when mucin is increased? So the excessive mucin disrupts the collagen fibers architecturally, giving them a frayed appearance. Hyaluronic acid absorbs enormous amounts of water, which results in induration and thickening. Here's an example of scleridema on the back. So it results in thickening. And if you kind of press on the back, you can feel that indurated texture. There are three types of scleridema, infection related, which presents following a strep infection classically, usually in the cervicofacial region, gammopathy related, which presents in conjunction with a monoclonal gammopathy, such as IgG kappa, and diabetes related, which presents on the back of an adult with insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. Visceral involvement can include GI, pulmonary, cardiac, and pleural effusions. Since we're on the subject of monoclonal gammopathy, an IgG monoclonal gammopathy can be associated with AL amyloidosis, multiple myeloma, diffuse planes anthoma, sweet syndrome, scleridema. NXG or necrobiotic xanthogranuloma and scleromyxedema, rather. IgM monoclonal gammopathy is usually associated with Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia, cryoglobulinemia, Schnitzler syndrome, and primary biliary cirrhosis. And IgA monoclonal gammopathies are usually associated with plasma cytoma, POEM syndrome, PG erythema elevatum diutinum, SW, and IgA pemphigus. So here's a picture of scleridema, waxy non-pitting induration of the, of the back skin. So when you're looking at the back, it appears more plump. There's more volume. There's more erythema as well. So if you try to pinch this back skin, you can expect that it's going to be very indurated. Just realized that I read an abbreviation on the last slide and didn't clarify what it stood for. So SW is Sneddon Wilkinson. Scleridema of Bushke. So what are the features? This is from Elson's textbook. Scleridema 
you're going to see thickened dermis, widened spaces with mucin between normal collagen bundles. The mucin is most prominent in the deep dermis. You probably won't see an inflammatory infiltrate or increased fibroblasts. If you did, you might think of another entity like scleromyxedema. The histologic features can be very subtle and mimic normal skin at scan, but there is increased space between collagen fibers in the deep dermis. So I will say that a biopsy of normal back skin can look very similar to scleroedema, and you're going to have to correlate clinically. So if there isn't a change clinically, and the clinician knows that this is different, the patient knows this is different from their normal back skin, you see increased widened spaces, it's a good idea to order a mucin stain, especially if they say rule out scler scleroedema. So you definitely don't want to just say normal back skin, especially if it's from the back and they're considering that the patient either has a gammopathy of some sort or they're post-infection or they have diabetes. So think about that. And if you have to order a mucin stain, go ahead and order it and look at the, and just really interrogate to make sure that there's not an increase in mucin. So here uh, from low power, I mean, if, if I said this was from the back, it, from low power, you may not see anything that really piques your interest here. So you have a thickened dermis, deep dermal mucin down here. And this is actually easier to see on h &E than most examples. So this is a nice example of scleroedema because you have so much mucin that you don't even need a stain to see it. Some other examples on the left, I would be shocked if you, if you were able to see the mucin. It just looks like clear white spaces in between the collagen bundles. You have increased mucin here on the upper right, and then the alcium blue highlights that increased mucin on the lower right. So what do you see on the pathology of scleroderma, scleroedema, and scleromyxedema? So with scleroderma, you're looking for increased collagen. Scleroedema, you're looking for increased mucin in the dermis. In scleromyxedema, you're looking for increased collagen, increased mucin, and increased cellularity made up of increased fibroblasts, so-called busy dermis. Pretibial myxedema is associated with hyperthyroidism or Graves' disease, hypothyroid, hypothyroidism or myxedema, and Hashimoto's disease. Graves' disease leads to exophthalmos. This is probably also likely to deposition of mucin right behind the ocular tissue. This may present after correction of hyperthyroidism. So here is a codochrome of deposition of mucin within the pretibial area. This is a very dramatic example of pretibial myxedema. I do think that you could get a codochrome like this on your exam. So be uh, ready to answer pretibial myxedema. The other differential diagnosis in a situation like this would be chronic venous stasis and thinking about elephantiasis and ostrovaricosa. Pretibial myxedema, this is a chart from Elston. It shows large amounts of mucin throughout the dermis, collagen bundles separated by mucin, and reduced to thin wisps. So here you see on the left, increased cellularity, some increased collagen, some increased fibroblasts. And if you do an alcium blue, it highlights the increase in mucin. So you can see that there's a lot of edema here. And if you know it's from the pretibial area, this will establish the diagnosis of pretibial myxedema. Here's another example, actually just highlighting, you may not see the mucin, in the example that you're given, but you can see this empty space in between the collagen bundles. So it's a very white appearance, very large distance between the collagen bundles. So this is pretibial myxedema. <clears throat> Just another picture showing those collagen areas reduced to thin wisps. So scleromyxedema, may also be referred to as papular mucinosis. You see generalized and scleroderma lichen myxinomatosis. 
presents with leonine facies and many presentations of this. Lichen myxinomatosis, there's different variants. You can have discrete papular, which is associated with HIV, acral persistent, which is also associated with HIV, cutaneous mucinosis of infancy, and a nodular form as well. Here you see the leonine facies, deposition of the mucin throughout the forehead, the cheeks, the chin, etc. So there is a, an acronym here. You can think about leonine lamps. L stands for leishmaniasis, lipoid proteinosis, lymphoma, leukemia cutis, and the permanent leprosy. A stands for actinic reticuloid form of chronic actinic dermatitis. M stands for mastocytosis or mucinosis. P stands for progressive nodular histiocytoma or pachyderma periostitis. And S stands for scleromyx edema, systemic amyloidosis, and sarcoidosis. And I forgot to mention here the MCRH stands for multicentric reticulohistiocytosis. So scleromyx edema, you can see presentations even on the dorsal hands. So in panel A to the left, you see thick and bound down skin to the back, little nonspecific, but in B, you can see confluent lichenoid papules and indurated skin of the hand and the wrist. Scleromyx edema can be associated with IgG lambda, as we mentioned before. So IgG lambda monoclonal gammopathy, as well as visceral disease affecting multiple organ systems. So with the GI system, you have dysphagia, the pulmonary system, restrictive disease, proximal muscle weakness, carpal tunnel syndrome, and peripheral neuropathy, and CNS disturbance leading to dermatoneuro syndrome. On histopathology, you're going to look for the increase in dermal fibroblasts with fine collagen fibers and mucin. Histologically, looks very similar to nephrogenic fibrosing dermopathy. So here you see scleromyx edema, superficial to mid dermal fibroplasia, and increased mucin. Another example here, even without a mucin stain, you can appreciate the increased blue color throughout the interstitial space. You see the increase in cellularity throughout as well and increased collagen. So scleromyxoedema, scleromyx edema. Higher power shows the mucin, spindle cells, and collagen that you see in scleromyx edema. You may have on the left areas of thickened dermis. On the upper right, you see the increase in mucin. And on the lower right, you see the ocean blue highlighting the mucin. <clears throat> As I said, histologically, scleromyx edema resembles nephrogenic fibrosing dermopathy. You have to think about the clinical setting because obviously nephrogenic fibrosing dermopathy occurs in patients with renal failure and usually involves the distal extremities, whereas with scleromyx edema, it's associated with IgG paraproteinemia and typically involves the face. Here are some codochrome showing you Nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, thickening and induration of the skin can be pretty conspicuous, but the lesions may also show this kind of purple brown plaque, papules to plaques, coalescing. And if you look in the eyes, you can see scleral plaques, in this case, in a patient less than 45 years of age. And so if, if you actually can see some ocular changes coupled with these skin changes, and the history fits, you can think about nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. So here's a low power image. You can see this increased mucin in the dermis, high cellularity, high collagen. It sounds exactly like scleromyx edema. Here's a higher power view showing the spindle cell kind of um, fibroblastic proliferation with increased mucin in between collagen fibers. The key is, is if you do a CD34 stain, this actually may um, stain most of the cells, the spindle cells. If you do a pro-collagen one stain, you may get a similar result as the CD34 expression in this entity. To me, it's always been unclear why this entity has CD34 positive fibroblastic expression. However, this is something that based on the literature, 
seems to be supported. Now, if you, if you utilize a special method called energy dispersive spectroscopy, you may be able to detect particles of gadolinium that collected in the tissue. And again, this is the gadolinium post imaging in patients with renal failure. And that's how they got that nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. Usually it's post gadolinium. Now that we're aware that gadolinium is a culprit, I think that the frequency has decreased because of the knowledge of the association. Now the use of gadolinium has decreased. There's an article in Journal of Cutaneous Pathology, which found that there are these so-called lollipop lesions and nephrogenic systemic fibrosis that mimic a deep fungal infection, interestingly. So here is a figure showing this conventional section of this biopsy was taken from the left thigh and reveals a sclerotic dermis with dense sclerotic balls pierced by fibers. And it gives this appearance of a lollipop morphology, as you can see. And so what are lollipop lesions? These are sclerotic eosinophilic bodies with entrapped elastic fibers. So again, if you see this, you can think about nephrogenic systemic sclerosis or fibrosis rather, nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. Tumid lupus, one of my favorite uh, diagnoses to make. So if someone describes to you what they see on a biopsy and they say there's no epidermal change, there's superficial and deep perivascular and periadnexal lymphocytic infiltrate and abundant mucin in the dermis, think about tumid lupus. Here's the clinical of tumid lupus. Sometimes tumor lupus takes on this annular appearance. Sometimes it's more just kind of numular. Um, it's kind of indurated. It seems like it's a dermal process. Perhaps you might be thinking of GA or subacute cutaneous lupus, something of that nature. Um, tumid lupus, because of the superficial and deep perivascular and periadnexal lymphocytic inflammation and that mucin deposition gives you this appearance. If you were to biopsy this, where would you biopsy it? hoping you'd probably go here to the more erythematous indurated area because that's probably where you're going to see most of the pathology. Sometimes tumid lupus can affect the face. And the important thing about tumid lupus as opposed to other types of lupus is usually you don't have a lot of scarring after tumid lupus resolves, and that's because it leaves the dermal epidermal junction alone. So the epidermis is preserved, the reedy ridges are preserved, so you don't get a lot of scarring. Here's a low power example of tumid lupus. You can see the epidermis is just kind of sitting there uh, undisturbed. And then you have superficial and deep perivascular and periodnexal lymphocytic inflammation. On higher power, you can notice increased white spaces between the collagen, and that's where that mucin's collecting. Again, some periacrine inflammation as well. Often in the differential diagnosis, when you see superficial and deep perivascular inflammation and the epidermis is left alone, and clinically you see annular areas, you need to think about annular erythemas, particularly deep erythema annularis centrifugum, where you have some large lesions with completely faded central areas. It kind of takes on this serpiginous or annular pattern. So here's a biopsy to show deep erythema annularis centrifugum with normal epidermis and lymphocytic infiltrates about the vessels of the superficial and deep dermis. It can look a lot like tumid lupus, so a careful search for mucin increase is mandatory. If you don't see a lot of mucin increase and you see this pattern and it fits clinically, the diagnosis is more consistent with erythema annularis centrifugum. The other thing is I forgot to mention on the clinical image is that many times you'll see what we call a so-called trailing scale. So the scale is not on the edge like you would see in a fungal infection, but instead kind of backed up near the center of the lesion. That's so-called trailing scale. Focal mucinosis refers to a dome-shaped papule containing a pool of mucin. So if it's on acral skin, it's referred to as a digital myxoid cyst. Um, if you try to imagine what the patient is asking you to do in this picture, they're probably saying, doctor, can you pop this for me? 
I typically try to leave these alone because popping them often opens up this area and could increase the risk of a joint infection. So I think that if you could get them to somebody who does surgery on the hands and you could kind of excise this and properly close the skin around the joint, that that's probably the better thing to do. However, if you can imagine, many patients are going to go ahead and just take it upon themselves to pop it at home. And of course, that does increase the risk of infection as well. And often it will just reaccumulate mucin. Here you see a large collection of empty white space. That's all mucin locally collected. If you were to do a stain, in this case, colloidal iron stain, it highlights the mucin. Now, uh, just an important point, mucin stains, if you talk about different kinds of muc mu mucin stains and someone says colloidal iron, don't let that word iron confuse you. Colloidal iron is a special stain that highlights mucin. Moving on to amyloidosis. So amyloidosis is actually a broad term. Many people think that it refers to the same protein collection. In fact, it's protein collection, but it can be different types of protein and different causes. So amyloidosis as a broad term refers to several diseases sharing common features. And the common feature is abnormal deposition of eosinophilic amyloid protein in various tissues. So what are the properties of amyloid? Insoluble fibril protein aggregates with beta pleated sheet configuration. So here is a table to remind you of different types of amyloidoses. You can have systemic amyloidosis, localized cutaneous amyloidosis, or hereditary amyloidosis. Within the systemic category, you can have primary or secondary. The primary amyloidosis is typically composed of lambda gamma chain, which are derived from antibody, the clinical features involve the tongue, the heart, the GI tract, and the skin. You can see petechiae, purpura, and waxy skin-colored papules, as well as alopecia, carpal tunnel syndrome, and neuropathy, and arthropathy. Secondary usually involves AA protein chains. And clinically, you'll see that this is a result of chronic disease, such as TB, leprosy, Hodgkin's disease, reactive arthritis, syphilis, etc. Usually secondary does not involve the skin. You might see amyloid in the adrenals, liver, spleen, and kidney as well. Localized cutaneous amyloidosis, some of my fav favorite diseases here. I want you to remember that in macular and lichenoid amyloidosis, the protein that's altered is keratin. This is a favorite test question. So know that the amyloid that is deposited in the dermis and localized cutaneous amyloidosis like macular amyloidosis or lichen amyloidosis is actually keratin protein. And so thus it would be positive for an anti-keratin stain. Clinically, macular amyloidosis will show rippled brown macules in interscapular regions on the back. It's associated with notalgia peristetica, which is a nerve dysfunction that allows for people to feel itchy in the same area, they're going to constantly scratch, and this is going to lead to altered keratin deposition in the dermis. Lichen amyloidosis is just a more robust form of macular amyloidosis, but now you're getting a lichenoid appearance. So brown scaly papules in the bilateral shins, for example, this is the most common presentation. And nodular localized cutaneous is usually due to AL chains. Again, this is the same chains that you see in primary systemic amyloidosis. However, it's just going to be affecting single or multiple nodules on the extremities, genitals, trunk, or face. Localized cutaneous means that it's not affecting systemic organs. <clears throat> and hereditary usually involves familial Mediterranean fever and muckle wells. These are due to the fibril protein AA. In familial Mediterranean fever, which is autosomal recessive, you have intermittent fevers, renal amyloidosis, peritonitis, and pleurisy. This is a result of an MEFV gene mutation, which involves the Marinostrin pyrin protein. <clears throat> 
Muckle Wells is an autosomal dominant entity. And here you have periodic attacks of urticaria, fever, deafness, and renal amyloidosis. And then there is this hemodialysis association, and this is caused by the beta-2 microglobulin fibroprotein. So review this chart, especially before your exams, because there are several questions that can be derived from these entities. So here you see variable tissue infiltration and systemic amyloidosis. In panel A, you can see the lymphadenopathy. In panel B, the macroglossia. Panel C, muscle pseudohypertrophy, and D, periorbital edema. Often you get this pinch purpura, as they call it. And so if you see this, be thinking amyloidosis. What are some other manifestations of systemic AL amyloidosis? So in A, you can see extensive purpura due to capillary fragility. B, scleroderma-like skin changes affecting the hands and C, nail dystrophy. So what do you see on histopathology? You can see pale pink amorphous homogenous fissured material. And what are the stains? Everyone likes to ask about the stains for amyloidosis. So Congo red, which is brick red on a normal H&E stain. And after the Congo red, you can see um, a, a more brick red. If you were to polarize this, you could look for apple green bipharyngeans with polarization. Thioflavin T, you have to visualize with fluorescent microscopy, and this is very sensitive. Crystal violet is really sensitive for the epidermal derived amyloid. There's also methyl violet, cotton dye pagoda red, which is the most specific for amyloid, scarlet red, serious red, and PAS can all highlight beta pleated protein fibrils or so-called amyloid. So here's an example of the Congo red. This is not polarized. This is just looking through the normal light. And you see this deposition of this brick red material. If you were to polarize this, you could see apple green by pharyngeans. So cutaneous amyloid, as I mentioned, referred to nodular amyloidosis, which is the AL immunoglobulin light chain or macular and lichen amyloidosis, which include altered keratin. Nodular amyloidosis, think about the clinical distribution here. It can be localized to the skin. That's kind of why it's, it's the uh, cutaneous localized, or it can be associated with systemic amyloidosis. But again, if you've got nodular amyloidosis in the skin and systemic, then it's just better to call it systemic amyloidosis. Now, if you do find localized nodular amyloidosis, think about the association with a plasma cytoma. Here you can see some nodular amyloid deposition at the tip of the nose in this patient. What are you going to look for on histopathology? Large fissured pale pink masses, just like as in amyloid, usually prominent plasma cells as well. So you can see this large amorphous eosinophilic material and a lot of plasma cells within the the in between those nodular amyloid aggregates. A lower power from Dr. Elson's textbook showing fissured pale pink material, some kind of cracked, just like that fissured cracked appearance in between these large eosinophilic depositional areas. And if you do a conga red on this, you'll see that nice brick red color popping out here in those areas that correspond to the eosinophilic aggregate. Macular amyloid, most of the time we see it in intrascapular area. Clinically, it looks mottled with hyperpigmentation and it's produced by chronic scratching. So here you see this kind of mottled dispigmentation in the intrascapular space. Now on biopsy, it may look very subtle from low power and may even look like normal skin. However, if you go into the papillary dermis, you'll see these sparse pink deposits with these sparse networks of melanophages. This is a great picture of this. So if you go on higher power, you see these pink deposits in the papillary dermis and melanophages kind of, kind of stuffed in between the small spaces of those pink deposits.
lichen amyloidosis, it looks different than lichen simplex chronicus. So lichen amyloidosis, you actually see more of these very clean, discrete, clear, white with an erythematous rim papules. And they're kind of coalescing into this large plaque. So that's the classic clinical appearance of lichen amyloidosis. It's the most common form, primary cutaneous amyloidosis, intensely pyritic. So again, you could see some LSC type changes, but here, this doesn't look like classic tree bark LSC. This looks more like a papular uh, eruption that's coalescing into large reticulated plaques. And this is lichen amyloid. So if you see those rows of papules in the interior shin, think about it. Now histopathology, it looks a lot like macular amyloid, but it's got that superimposed lichen simplex chronicus change, with hyperkeratosis, acanthosis, hypergranulosis, and you can see those sparse amyloid deposits in the dermis. So here you have, it almost has the ball and claw appearance that you might see in a um, lichenitidis. However, what you see here is this pale amorphous material instead of lymphohistiocytic inflammation. So pale amorphous material, melanophages, and then that hyperkeratosis. So it is essentially an LSC superimposed on a larger, more intense macular amyloidosis. So in this case, it's lichen amyloidosis. Just another example. All right, now thinking about in terms of deposition, don't forget about calcium. So calcium or calcinosis cutis has five different types of ways it can present. So you can have dystrophic calcification, which you often see in connective tissue disease, paniculitis, genetic diseases, infections, and neoplasms. Metastatic calcification includes hypervitaminosis, milk alkali syndrome, sarcoidosis familial tumoral calcinosis, hyperparathyroidism, and neoplasms. And idiopathic, meaning we couldn't figure out what caused it. You can see this in calcified nodules, subepidermal calcified nodules, sporadic tumoral calcinosis, or miliolite calcinosis. Iatrogenic includes things like extravasated calcium or EKG paste, calcium alginate dressings, or to liver transplant. And then, of course, there's calciphylaxis. <clears throat> so what do you see on histopathology? Calcium is very basophilic on H&E stains. And there are two major stains you should remember. Von Cossa special stain stains calcium black. And alizarin red stains calcium red. Here you see dystrophic calcification and a ruptured cyst. Again, you can see thin areas of collagen and keratin, but on H&E, a very purple staining or very deep basophilic area often correlates with calcium. Here's an example of calcinosis cutis. So you can have small deposits of intensely basophilic material in the superficial dermis. These can also be associated with scarring as well. Here's a von Cossa stain highlighting calcium black. Calciphylaxis is most often seen in patients with chronic renal failure or hyperparathyroidism and diabetes mellitus. In a subset of patients, you can have non-uremic calciphylaxis. So calciphylaxis in a patient with chronic renal failure is shown here. You can see these stellate-shaped necrotic plaques on the abdomen and scars from peritoneal dialysis. Often the thighs and the buttocks are involved. If you're suspecting calciphylaxis, you want to get through the necrosis and actually find the calcified vessels. So it's a good idea to do a deep biopsy that really gets down to the subcutaneous fat. It can help make the diagnosis. If you're looking for calcification in the media of small and medium-sized vessels. Histologically, subcutaneous calcium deposits and fat necrosis can be seen. Another example of calciphylaxis, you see this kind of stellate, dark, dark gray to even blackening plaque. A lot of this is due to the calcification in the deeper vessels leading to ischemia and cell death above or downstream of the vessel that's affected. 
So what are you going to see on histopathology? Calcified small vessels and the subcutaneous fat, as well as fat necrosis. So here you see that calcium depositing within the media of small vessels within the fat. Another example, large calcium fragments actually existing in the wall and within the lumen of this vessel. You can have scrotal calcinosis, which is clinically believed to be calcified epidermal inclusion cysts. Histopathologically, you'll find amorphous calcium deposits along with smooth muscles scattered throughout the dermis. So sc scrotal calcinosis is shown here. You may see some smooth muscle, some uh, kind of undulating, thickened epidermis. This is scrotal calcinosis. This is actually pretty high yield for your exam, so I would know this. Again, how are you going to know it's scrotal calcinosis, this kind of rippled, undulating epidermis, maybe some bands of smooth muscle bundles, and then these collections of calcium. Again, this is scrotal calcinosis cutis, and there is a national expert, Dr. Joshua Fox, who could elaborate more on this. Subepidermal calcified nodule includes commonly on the chins of children or on the heels of newborns. So what happens is these patients have some trauma, some dystrophy in the area, and it causes a calcified nodule. Ochronosis is due to an inherited alkaptinuria, which is autosomal recessive disorder due to homogentisic acid oxidase deficiency. Exogenous ochronosis can be due to overapplication of hydroquinone or phenol as well. So if someone has melasma and they're asking for bleaching cream, you want to be careful when you're prescribing hydroquinone that they don't apply it every single day for the rest of their life or else they're going to acquire this exogenous ochronosis, which we'll show some pictures of. So here is ochronotic discoloration that you can see through a thin area of skin overlying the pigmented cartilage of the ear. Again, sclera is often a window into what's going on in the body. So in this case, ochronosis or alcoptinuria has this pathognomonic ocular sign. You can see a grayish to black scleral pigmentation interior to where the tendon insertions are in the horizontal recti muscle. And the pigmentation of the elastic tissue in pingecula may stain a darker brown or black, usually as a configuration of little rings. In advanced cases of ochronosis, Bowman's membrane, which is adjacent to the limbus, may have areas of black pigmentation. So to all of our ophthalmology friends out there, a shout out, the sclera and the findings in the ocular region can definitely help cinch the diagnosis of ochronosis. Now, exogenous ochronosis is something we definitely want to try to avoid. We do not want to overprescribe hydroquinone to patients and, and tell them to use it every day because what's going to happen is they're going to develop this paradoxical darkening of the skin, which is due to the overinhibition of homogentistic acid oxidase, leading to the production of um, basically deposition of the homogentistic acid within the dermis. And so you get these yellow, brown, glassy, almost ochre colored banana shaped deposits in the dermis. And this is that so-called banana body picture that you're going to see in an exogenous ochronosis. Now, this is even harder to fix compared to melasma. So I tell them that we don't want to replace one pigment disorder with another by over applying the uh, hydroquinone. In early lesions of exogenous ochronosis, if you were to do a biopsy, you may only see markedly swollen collagen fibers without the classic banana body deposition. But in later ochronosis, you see those typical swollen, irregular golden brown fibers at the bottom left. So gout is, as we all know from medical school, um, clinically defined as recurrent attacks of acute inflammatory arthritis due to hyperuricemia. On pathology, you'll see palisading granulomas around amorphous feathery pink material. This is very high yield to be able to recognize on an exam. The uric acid crystals are 
made of monosodium urate, which are dissolved in formalin. Stains include 20% silver nitrate or galentha stain, specific for urates. Oftentimes, if you want to try to preserve the feathery-like amorphous appearance and you want to preserve the crystals, then it's good to use an ethanol-based fixative. So carnoise fluid is one thing. And I remember stories of people, people actually using whiskey to fix tissue that they want to preserve the crystals and gout. So it's negative birefringence on polarized light as opposed to pseudo gout, which is positive birefringence. Here's a clinical image of an inflamed joint space due to gout. And on biopsy, you can see deposition of this kind of amorphous feathery material, wispy kind of architecture, thin spaces in between the thin eosinophilic material. So this is that feathery appearance of the deposition. On higher power, you can really appreciate that feathery texture that you see in gout. Again, this is going to be high yield for your exam. And you see some surrounding granulomatous inflammation as well. Another image from the textbook of Elston, which shows that palisading granuloma around the feathery material. See those feathery clefts with the surrounding granulomatous material again, just to nail it and to hammer it home. Urethropedic protoporphyria or EPP. This is an autosomal dominant disease. It is characterized by photosensitivity with burning, heals with waxy scars. These patients can have gallstones and hepatic damage. Usually presents in childhood. The face, hands, and upper arms are affected. You can see deficiency of paraketolase, normal urine porphyrins, and elevated serum and fecal protoporphyrins. So here you see, um, obviously in a photosensitive location on the body, you've got these kind of scabbed over papules coalescing into plaques on the upper forehead, the cheeks, the nose, around the mouth. When they heal, they kind of have these scars, depressed scar-like areas. Another example of the tip of the nose affected as well as the helix of the ear. The dorsal hands being photoexposed as well are also affected. And on pathology, you're going to see this reduplicated membrane or hyaline cuff around post-capillary venules. So here is a picture from Dr. Elson's textbook showing the hyaline cuffs around the blood vessels. PAS stain really highlights that reduplication of the basement membrane within the vessel. Colloid milium, you can have different types of colloid milium. So there's the adult type associated with severe solar damage, occurs on the face, neck, and dorsal hands. The juvenile type, which is typically not associated with sun damage, but it's on the head and neck. The pigmented type, which is the adult type, you can see um, positive uh, a pigmented type and adult type with hydroquinone or phenol. Colloid degeneration or pericolloid on the penis, and then the acral keratosis with eosinophilic dermal deposits. So here you see this kind of robust nodular ripple texture in patients with diffuse sun exposed skin, colloid milium. This is occurring in more of a younger patient, so the kind of the juvenile type. Again, fine little cleared, almost translucent skin color to erythematous papules. And if you were to biopsy these, what would you see on pathology? So you're going to look for pale pink fissure deposits within the papillary dermis. In the adult type, these are going to be positive for conga red, thioflavin, and crystal violet, and negative for pagoda red. Whereas in the juvenile type, you'll see positivity for anti-keratin, but not positivity for conga red. Here's a classic image, low power of colloid milium. You can see that when the blade kind of cuts through it, it forms this rippled artifact. 
this kind of ridged artifact where that blade's cutting through the colloid million. I think that that's a pretty characteristic appearance of colloid million. It seems to kind of break and fissure along the razor edge plane. Here's another example of that. Lipoid proteinosis, one of my favorite entities. It's an autosomal recessive disease due to an ECM1 mutation. If you remember ECM1, is it should ring a bell for lichen sclerosis editrophigus. So if you have an anti-antibody against ECM1 circulating in patients with lichen sclerosis editrophigus, then you can think about how ECM1 mutation and anti-ECM1 antibodies result in this hyalinization of the dermis. So in LSA, you see hyalinization of the superficial dermis. And in lipoproteinosis, you see hyaline-like material deposited in many organs. Uh, this includes the skin, oral mucosa, the larynx, and the brain. The earliest sign of lipoid proteinosis is hoarseness, and this is permanent for life. These patients also have skin fragility and blistering occurring, and the blisters heal with scar-like appearance. You can see infiltrated papules and plaques, especially on the elbows and extensor aspects of the arms and the lower legs, and they take on a verrucous appearance. The classic test question will involve beaded papules on the eyelid margin, so-called monoliform blepharosis. And you can also see calcification of the temporal lobes in the amygdala. So in panel A, you can see an early bullous lesion with typical, typical hemorrhagic crust, and it heals with scarring, as you can see in panel B, in lipoid proteinosis. You can see restricted mobility of the tongue due to infiltration of the frenulum in lipoid proteinosis. You can have discoloration of the lips as well in association with lipoid proteinosis. This kind of verrucous appearance to the elbow. And here is the classic beaded papules along the margins of the eyelid. So the monoliform blepharosis. You can see the increased severity of the yellowish waxy lesions and sun exposed areas. So on histopathology, you're going to want to look for dilated blood vessels and thickening the walls. Eosinophilic hyaline deposits around blood vessels and sweat glands. Now, this is much deeper and much more extensive than urethropoietic protoporphyria, but it can look very similar, and that's why they're both included in the lecture here. So yes, you can see reduplicated basement membrane, as you could also see in EPP, and type 4 collagen and laminin are increased around the vessels as well. So you can see reduplication around the basement membrane of the vessels and this abundant hyalinization of the superficial papillary dermis, as well as getting into the reticular dermis. Again, very thick around the vessels. As you can see, abundant eosinophilic material around these small caliber vessels. Lipoid proteinosis often has hyperkeratosis, as well as vertically oriented eosinophilic deposits in the dermis. So if you can kind of trace out a line, it's vertically oriented like this. And it looks very hyalinized and clinically it's fitting for lipoid proteinosis, then you can make the diagnosis. Using a PAS stain, you can see extensive deposition, PAS positive diastase resistant hyaline material in the dermis of a scar like lesion of lipoid proteinosis. So, thinking about differential diagnosis, the hyaline material in EPP affects the superficial vessels as I said, whereas lipoid proteinosis involves the superficial and deeper vessels as well as eccrine glands. Also thinking about the difference between porphyria cutanea tarda, which demonstrates much smaller hyaline cuffs around superficial vessels, as well as solar elastosis in the surrounding skin. And if you're looking at PCT classically, you'll wanna look for caterpillar bodies, subdermal bulla, and festooning. So on an exam, you may have to separate EPP, lipoid proteinosis, and porphyria cutanea tarda based on these subtle but different findings. Lastly, we're going to finish up with nutritional dermatoses. So 
the hallmark of nutritional dermatoses on pathology is going to be pallor in the upper epidermis of the keratinocytes. However, if you see that on pathology, you may not be able to tell exactly what the nutritional def deficiency is. So you have to really kind of marry the clinical and pathologic together. As a reminder, pellagra is a deficiency in niacin, which leads to the three Ds, as they call it, diarrhea, dementia, and dermatitis. You get a Casal's necklace inflammatory pattern, which we will show. Artnip disease, which is impaired absorption of tryptophan. It's similar to pellagra, but you also get ataxia as well as aminoaciduria. Acrodermatitis enteropathica is a deficiency of zinc, which leads to periolar dermatitis, acral dermatitis, and diarrhea. And necrolytic migratory erythema, or glucagonoma, which is caused by glucagonoma. You can see figure eight erythema with flaccid bulla that rupture, leaving an erosion with scale. So here you can see um, uh, what happens when you have zinc deficiency with the acrodermatitis enteropathica, that perioral dermatitis, the acral dermatitis. This patient probably also has diarrhea. Here you can see what happens in pellagra with the Casals necklace here, darkening around the kind of neck area, the dermatitis, diarrhea, dementia, et cetera. And what are you going to see on histopathology? This is very testable and high yield. You're going to look for confluent perikeratosis and psoriasiform hyperplasia. So it almost looks like psoriasis, but you've got pallor or ballooning in the upper third of the epidermis without necrosis. So here you have the pallor of the superficial epidermis is a really nice example. And then the psoriasiform hyperplasia, as well as perivascular lymphocytes. And the higher power view, and this is from Dr. Elson Sex, which really beautifully shows the upper keratinocytes, upper third, upper half to one third, actually, of pallor and ballooning of these keratinocytes. So this could be acrodermatitis enteropathica, it could be pellagra. So you really have to correlate clinically um, with the scenario to be able to make that diagnosis. That being said, if on an exam you were given answer choices and only one was a nutritional deficiency, you definitely want to choose that nutritional deficiency. All right. Well, that wraps up this lecture. Thanks for your attention.